Good evening. <laughs> Seems as though we're getting better and better on this. It's some, right on the dot, pretty much, right? So good again to uh, see everyone this evening. We ask as, uh, as we begin, um, if you do have any electronic devices, please uh, turn them off or we'll place it on mute in order not to disturb the worship service uh, this evening. And if you are watching from the Facebook, we actually hit like so we know that you are there. On our sick list, a uh, request for prayers this evening. Brenda Sellers' mother is home from the hospital, but have to be on hospice care soon. So please keep this family in prayer. As well as Adam Zach is recovering from dental surgery, please keep him in prayer. And uh, Brianna Grifford is scheduled to have dental surgery as well coming up this week. So please keep her also in prayer. Jody and uh, Greg Cole are having health issues. Uh, please pray for them. Josephine Spears' cousin is recovering from having a leg amputated and her sister Rose is healing, but is in need of continued prayers. Please pray for them. Also, the Williams family is in the final stages of adopting Micah. So please keep that family in prayer that this process goes well. On our sympathy list, we wish to extend our sympathy to DeMartha Bell and her family on the loss of her sister Betty on Thursday. So I talked to Martha, she's headed out this week. So please, she'll be driving. So please keep Sister Bell in prayer. We wish to extend our sympathy also to Amanda Pettis and her family on the sudden loss of her cousin, son. It's always difficult to lose a child, so please keep this family in prayer. In other announcements, we, uh, as mentioned this morning, we want to thank all the men and the young men that participated yesterday in the building uh, cleanup. Uh, as you notice, uh, W.S. Young has always had a large yard. So we appreciate everybody that came out to support that effort. Sheet Keepers meeting. We will have a brief Sheet Keepers meeting on Sunday, April 9th, following the morning service. Now we understand uh, next weekend is Easter. So we will keep it brief, but we ask everyone to sign up, uh, please come out and attend that meeting. And also, if you haven't signed up and you just want more details on the Sheet Keepers meeting, please also attend that meeting as well. Ladies Retreat, Ladies Retreat, join us for our Ladies Retreat on Saturday, April 22nd, starting at 9.30 a.m. at the Nolanville Campground. For more information, please see the Ladies Bulletin Board. And also I have another uh, announcement uh, the normal Saturday breakfast and work day will be canceled this weekend. Combined fellowship luncheon and singing with the Southside Church of Christ. We are hosting a fellowship luncheon and singing on Sunday, April 30th, following the morning worship service beginning at 1 p.m. Sign up in the foyer for food and duties and please make plans to attend understanding we're going to have a, a large group of people. Uh, if anybody watched the, the Final Four this weekend, the term that I got in mind for this luncheon is full court press, right? We're going to need everybody involved for this group of people. So please sign up uh, on, the, on the bulletin. Cherokee Home for Children Drive. We're collecting following items for Cherokee Home for the children through April the 30th, cinnamon pop tarts, breakfast bar, cereal, paper plates, paper towels, toilet tissue, Kleenex, and table napkins. These items can be placed in the foyer under the sun. 
Also, the ladies drive for families in crisis. We were collecting items from families in crisis, women's shelter until the 14th of May. Please bring new socks for women and children and toilet, uh, toiletries. These items also can be placed in the foyer. One more announcement that I did miss this morning, but uh, uh, Tim Matter, uh, he, he is going to uh, Columbia. When Tim first told me that he would take a contract job in, in Columbia, uh, I thought he was talking about Columbia, South Carolina, <laughs> but this is Bogota, Columbia, right? So his plane leaves, he, I spoke to him at the luncheon, his plane leaves at 3 p.m. on Monday. So he asks again to please keep him and his family in prayer in his absence. It's all the announcements that I have. First prayer will be Tom Hollerback. Song leader will be Gaylord Williams. Scripture reading is Scott Davis. Bill McIntosh will have our sermon. Uh, communion and offering will be Reggie Bass and Daryl Higginbottom. And closing prayer will be Adam Zach. you pray with me, please? <clears throat> the most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, Father <clears throat> once again, we thank Thee for this day. Heavenly Father, what a great and wonderful way to start the week, this first day of the week, Heavenly Father, then to be in Thy house with Christians, with brothers and sisters in Christ, Heavenly Father, to sing songs of praise, to hear a portion of Thy Word. To start the week off, in a positive note, Heavenly Father. And what a great, wonderful way to live a life. The Christian life is a great, wonderful way, Heavenly Father. Father, we're so thankful for all the blessings that thou, thou has given unto us. And Father, as we go throughout this week, that we will think about the lessons that we have heard today, that we will study them, look at them, ponder on them, Heavenly Father. Apply them to our lives, Heavenly Father, to be better Christians, to serve thee better as our lives goes on. Father, as temptation comes our way, we pray, Heavenly Father, that we will pray on these things, that we will seek thy truth, seek thy power, Heavenly Father, to seek thy love, to be as Jesus, the master teacher, Heavenly Father, to use scripture, to defeat the devil and overcome whatever temptation that comes our way. Father, we pray for those who were mentioned a few moments ago in the announcements. We pray for those that are having surgery. We pray for those who are going to be traveling. We pray for all these individuals, Heavenly Father, they'll be safe and sound, and everything will work out for the greater their benefit. And now, Heavenly Father, we ask that thou will forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please open your song book to number 131. 131. If you have it, let us see. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, seeking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the water sinking, now sin that am I. The Lord lifted me. The Lord Lifted me when nothing else could help. The Lord lifted me. The Lord lifted me. The Lord lifted me when nothing else could help. The Lord lifted me. 
All my heart to him I give, ever to him I cling. In his blessed presence, ever his praises sing. Love so mighty and so true, buries my soul's best songs. Faithful, loving service to to him, this is the love lives in me. Souls in danger look above, Jesus completely saves. He will lift you by his love out of the angry waves. He's the master of the sea, billows his will obey. He will take you to be the same to me. The love is in me. In me, when nothing else can help, love lives in me. Love lives in me. Love lives in me. When nothing else can help, love lives in me. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. Listen, Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You are to love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. Let these words that I'm commanding you today be always on your heart. If you'd like to mark the song of invitation, it'll be in number 214-214. Song before our lesson, be hymn number 49. Hymn number 49. If you have it, let us sing. Sweetly, Lord, have we heard Follow me, and we see when the footprints only lead us to be. Footprints of Jesus and make the pathway go. We will follow the steps of Jesus when the rest go. Though they be on a seeking the sheep, or on the flashing of the mountains and the day not we, but the prince of Jesus stands the we will all Jesus her If they
Evening. Anybody ready to pick off where we were this morning and start with H and go to Z? We might be here a little while, but I'm sure we could probably find something related to each one of those letters. No, that is not our lesson this evening, though certainly temptation is a lesson that we should always keep before our eyes because of how dangerous it is and how sometimes so frustratingly weak uh, we can be. That is not our lesson this evening. Our lesson this evening is to discuss the conditional blessings of Israel, to talk about the peaks and the valleys, the highs and the lows of ancient Israel. We're going to begin, though, introducing the idea of promises, of opportunities, of the possibility of blessings, and then how things are not always what they seem. If you turn on the television and you watch a sporting event or some type of a, a sitcom or a program or perhaps even a, a, a news production. You're going to find during either that broadcast or commercials that break it up, a promise of something, a guarantee of an opportunity to have something. I remember whenever I was, was younger, there was this opportunity of something that, that my parents were, were able to have, and they, they sent, I guess, something in the mail, and they promised that you, you have won something. They didn't know exactly what you win, but you have won something, and you, you show up, and you, you have the possibility, maybe I've won the, the grand prize. You know, maybe you get the $1,000 prize, or, or maybe I get the big screen TV, or maybe you walk away with a $5 radio that was worth the time for you to drive over there, whatever that may be. There's the possibility of, of prizes all the time. There are, are companies that, that say that you can, you can win whatever prize this is, and if you win it, they'll, they'll pay off your mortgage. You can win this grand prize, and you get a, a brand new vehicle. How many of us are familiar with Publishers Clearinghouse? You don't have to make any purchase in order to apply, and you can hope to have this this grand prize i think it started in the hundreds and then i believe it went to a thousand and five thousand and then you've got the prize of a million here lately i see the the ads over the last handful of years of publishers clearing house and the, the grand prize which you can win five thousand dollars a week for the rest of your life now we can talk about the wisdom of whether it's good or not for you and i to have that uh, would $5,000 a week for the rest of your life make any of us maybe a little bit more lazy than we are now? Would it make any of us maybe a little bit more irresponsible than we are now? How would we use that money? You know, if someone were to say, here's $100 million, I'm not sure what that money would do and if I would even want the responsibility of that kind of money. In fact, Publishers Clearinghouse right now, I looked on their website, and I was preparing for this lesson, and uh, the, the well-known comedian, game show host, actor, whatever else he is or has been or ever will be, Steve Harvey, 
is on the picture of their website showing this this new grand prize, which is their once in a lifetime prize of fifteen million dollars. Now, we know that everybody who applies for this opportunity is not going to win the grand prize. We know that most people are going to come away disappointed. We also know that there is fine print. You ever noticed on the television, whatever they're showing some type of a prize, or, or even if it's just talking about home refinances or, or vehicle refinances or the, the, the new finance rate that they're offering for customers for a particular new truck or car. You ever notice that how much money they're going to save you is in enormous letters and what it's going to cost you is in a little bit. You have to get this close to your TV to find out what that fine print really is. What, what's the real truth about what's being offered here? You ever notice at the end of the commercials when they're trying to run through all of the legalese that they have to mention that tells you all the fine print, they rush through that as fast as they can. But how much they're going to give you? Oh, they're real slow about that. It's in, in great big letters, shining and glittering. Oh, that's kind of how those things work. Because with all of those offers of the possibilities of blessings come with these dreaded words, the terms and conditions that apply. Well, not to be disrespectful, not to in any way be sacrilegious or irreverent toward God. But some of those same things apply to what God offers to us. Now, the difference is what God offers to the world makes all of those things look horrible in comparison. God offers us the best opportunity of a blessing that the world could ever dream of. And that is being able to witness the eternal glory of God and the, the vision of the light of the Lamb there in heaven. For all of eternity, year after year after year, never ending, never failing, never fading, never growing old in a place where there is no tears, there is no pain, there are no aches, there is no death, there is no separation, there is no disappointment, there is no sin. And God is also different than all of these prizes that are offered and the opportunities, this grand prize, because God does not offer it to one lucky individual. But for every single person who has lived on the face of the earth who is willing to love, obey, and follow his son. God's promises, God's blessings, God's offerings to us would be considered the ultimate prize in the world. And yet, though God offers it to us, a very little cost to ourselves, though God offers it to us, paid for by the blood of his son. Though God offers it to us and begs us to take it freely, there still are conditions. There still are conditions to be met. God wants to invite every single human being he has ever seen. Every single soul that has been placed into a body. He wants to invite every one of those souls into his presence, into that throne room, into heaven for all of eternity. But the Bible tells us that's not going to happen. Not because God doesn't want it. But because the souls themselves don't need it. Because they're unwilling to keep the conditions that God has instructed mankind will result in the reception of those blessings. We see this play out time and time and time and frustratingly time again. Now, everyone that knows me, knows anything about what I enjoy discussing and reading and studying, knows the love that I have for the Old Testament. And I have said before, and I will say again, of the great value that exists in the Old Testament. One of the great things that that section of the Bible teaches us is an overwhelming description and example of God's long suffering. We can read that God is long suffering. The Bible tells us that God is long suffering. 
God is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but it's long suffering to us, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. The New Testament tells us. Peter writes there of the long suffering of God. And the New Testament tells us in another place that the long suffering of God is our hope for salvation. Because if God was not long suffering, none of us would have an opportunity to stand before him. But one of the greatest places that you actually learn the nuts and the bolts, and you see the connecting dots of God's long suffering is in the Old Testament. When he offers his people redemption, he offers them promises of blessing and hope and glory and brightness and bountifulness. He offers them homelands. He offers them homes. He offers them vineyards. He offers them wells. He offers them family. He offers them produce. And over and over and over, God promises these grand blessings. And generation after generation after generation, they simply leave him. And yet God's still there. For hundreds of years, God is faithful. And God is long-suffering. Even after the covenant has been broken, God stands by his side of it. Even after God's people turn away, God stands beside them, inviting them to come back in. We're going to talk about three things tonight. All of these points start with the same letter, as should be expected. They all start with the letter P if you're taking notes. First, we start with preservation. God was going to provide for and preserve his people. In the first book of the Bible, we see God promising an old man what's going to come from the, the fruit of his body. Now, this might have been confusing to this man because he's an old man who at that point has no fruit of his body. Abraham's over 90 years old and, and has no son. Now, we look around in this world, if, if we see a married couple who is in their mid-30s, their mid-40s, and their mid-50s, if they don't have any children by the time they're 40 or 45, we assume they probably won't have any children. Imagine seeing somebody in their 70s and their 80s and then in their 90s, and it's not until their 90s that they have children. Well, they're not expecting that. Nobody is expecting that at that point. You might say, well, but way back then, they lived to a really old, Abraham didn't live to a really old age. He lived longer than us. But Abraham didn't live to be 300 years old, 500 years old, 969 years old like Methuselah. Abraham lived to be, unless my memory fails me, around 175 years old. Now, it's certainly longer than you and me, but that doesn't mean that 90 at his age wasn't still an old man. And Abraham didn't have a son. God says you're going to have a son. God says, from your fruit, from your body, from the produce of your body, all of the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, we know this to be a messianic reference. We know this to mean that God would send his son to the world in the lineage of Abraham's seed. We know that this meant Isaac in the beginning of what we know to be the Israelite nation. God also promised that that nation that would come from Abraham, that would come from his son, not the son that he would have with a handmaid, but the son that he would have with his wife, Sarah, that that nation would endure some struggle. They would be taken captive in a strange land that would be there for a long time before they were able to come back to the land that Abraham was a stranger of as he stood there when God was giving him this message. As we fast forward from Genesis 12 and Genesis 15 and Genesis 17, when we read those various promises, as we fast forward from the time of Isaac's birth in Genesis 22 and 23, we see the nations continue there to grow as the, the generations continue to produce. And we find out about six generations later, the evolution of the continuation of God's promise. If we open our books, our Bibles, to the book of Exodus, and we find God calling a man to serve him. This man was the sixth in a generation from Abraham. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Levi, Kohath, Amram, and then finally Moses. 
And it is Moses whom God calls to serve him, to be a guide for his people, to be the mouthpiece and to liberate his people from the Pharaoh and from the land of Egypt, from their oppressors and taskmasters. We see in Exodus chapter 1, there arose a, a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph. We don't know exactly what that text means. The Hebrew word that's mentioned there doesn't really tell us what that means. It either could be someone of a different dynasty that didn't really know who Joseph was, or it could have been someone of a different dynasty that did know Joseph's relationship with the old dynasty and had no respect for Joseph and treated him as if he were lesser than, regardless of what that no Joseph meant. We know that his people were subjugated at that point, forced there into slavery, and they were burdened heavily with their service to the Egyptians. We know that their lives were bad. We know that their slavery was hard. We know that Pharaoh was so antagonistic towards God's people that he even sent out a decree that all of the male children should be killed as they were born. God says, I've heard my people. I've seen their plight. And in Exodus chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, God calls Moses, appearing to him in this burning bush, and sends him into the land. I'm going to use you to go into Egypt and bring my people out. And through Moses' leadership, God offered them many grand promises and blessings. You know, sometimes when you turn to the television, and you, you notice these great prizes that are mentioned. As I said a minute ago, you see the fine print. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Leviticus, chapter number 18. What we notice as God gives his promises is that God doesn't give fine print. The conditions that are applied to God's expectations are notable and clear. God is not hiding information. God is not finding a part of the law and somehow squeezing something in, in between the text. God's expectations for his people were front and center. There was no reason why they should have misunderstood or in any way been able to avoid God's conditions. I want you to read three sections of Old Testament scripture with me while we talk about this point. Leviticus chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, I am the Lord your God. According to the doings of the land of Egypt, where you dwelt, you shall not do. And according to the doings of the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you, you shall not do. Nor shall you walk in their ordinances. Now, let's just stop there at verse 3. Does that seem real hard to understand? That's not fine print, is it? God said, I took you out of the land of Egypt. Don't do what they did. I'm taking you into the land of Canaan. Don't do what they do. It's pretty simple. Verse 4, you shall observe my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk in them. And then he bookends that statement with the same way he began. I am the Lord your God. There's no fine print there. The conditions that God offers his people, I will care for you. I will love for you. I will provide for you. I will give you this land. I will give you its bounty. I will give you its produce. Only don't do what they do. Do what I tell you. It's pretty simple. They are the people of God. They weren't chosen because they were special. They weren't chosen because they were powerful. They weren't chosen because they were better than anybody else. In fact, they were chosen because they were smaller than other people. And through them, God could show the world his love and his power. See, through the years, though, they, they began to build this up in their minds, so much so of, of a sense of entitlement and arrogance that John the Baptizer told them in the first century, don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham to our father, because God can from these stones raise up children unto Abraham. You see, they had very deep pride in their heritage and in their lineage. But when you go back and look, God chose them for a specific purpose and gave them clear instructions and promising if they would abide by these conditions, he would provide for them. As I said this morning, not to beat the same horse, but as I said this morning, you, you don't need an advanced degree to be able to understand this. God says, if you love me and keep my commandments, I'll provide for you. If you ignore me and follow after the pagans and the ungodly, I'll let whatever comes there too. 
You don't have to follow me. I won't make you follow me. But if you want blessings, if you want peace, if you want joy, if you want salvation, follow me. Do these things and you will be blessed. It's relatively simple. There's no fine print there. You don't have to have a lawyer help to figure out what it is that God is offering them, what it is that he is warning and instructing them. Turn with me now, if you would, to the book of Deuteronomy. Go to chapter number 11. We're not actually going to read again the scripture for tonight, but I want to thank Scott for reading that scripture for us. We are familiar with Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 6. We shall love the Lord our God with our hearts, with our souls, with our minds, with all of our being. If I remember correctly, one of the Hebrew words that is mentioned there in Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6, is that we love God with our muchness. With all that makes us who we are, we, we love God with that. And he continues there in Deuteronomy 6, after he told them to meditate on the word and to teach it to their children diligently, to speak of God, to think of God, to talk of God when they sit down, when they rise up. When they lay down at night, when they get up in the morning, when they walk by the way, put it on their door close, put it on their gates, he goes further than that in the next few verses. And he says, when you get to this place of blessing, when you get to the place with wells you didn't dig, houses you didn't plant, vineyards you didn't plant, houses you didn't build, vineyards you didn't plant, remember God. Why would you need to remember God? Because God's the one that gave you those blessings. And if you forget God, those blessings can be removed. Let's read here in Deuteronomy chapter 11. Go down to verse 26. Now, to refresh our minds, if we have forgotten, or maybe perhaps there are some here tonight who you simply don't know because you've not been introduced to it yet. The generation to whom Moses is speaking in the book of Deuteronomy was not the same generation to whom Moses was speaking in the book of Exodus. The former generation had died in the wilderness along the way. And in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses is replaying for them, repeating for them God's promises, God's instructions, and God's warning to the younger generation the generation whose parents said we're grasshoppers in our own eyes and they're worried about their children. God says, well, it's your children that I'm going to send into the land then. It's those children before they go into the land of Canaan that Moses is talking to. And in verse 26, he says, behold, I set before you today a blessing and a curse. Now notice there's not fine print here, right? There's only two options. Just like Jesus said in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, there's only two ways. There's only two options. I set before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you today, and the curse, if you do not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. There's no fine print there. That's relatively clear, is it not? If you obey God, there's a blessing. If you disobey, there's a curse. He says, if you do not obey, but turn aside from the way which I command you today to go after other gods which you have not known, now it shall be when the Lord your God has brought you into the land which you go to possess, that you shall put the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount Ebal. Are they not on the other side of the Jordan toward the setting sun in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the plain opposite Gilgal beside the terebinth trees of Borah? Now realize he's talking to them on the east side of the Jordan River. He's talking to them as they are on the east side of the Jordan River and looking toward that promised land that was to their west, that land that dwelled between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. They had not yet gone into that land, but that was the land of the Canaanites that God was about to give them. And he says, when you get into that land on the other side of the Jordan, I want you to go to these two mountains, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. You're going to put the blessing on Mount Gerizim, and you're going to put the curse on Mount Ebal. Now, that perhaps might not mean too much to us unless we go look at the Bible and see what Joshua did when they get into the land. I want to share something with you very quickly, not to take too much time of our night. But there is a group of archaeologists associated with a religious school in the Houston area. And last year, they were sifting through some refuse piles, some uh, 
pieces of, of dirt and debris and, and particles that were taken from Mount Ebal. And they were put into this refuse pile because of whatever political reasons, they can't go to Mount Ebal anymore. They can't actually be on that mountain and excavate, but they were allowed access to these dump piles that came from Mount Ebal. And as they were wet sifting through, some of this product of the land that came out of the refuse pile from Mount Ebal, they came across what they call a curse tablet, a very small folded lead tablet. Guess what they found inside? They used some kind of scanning technology. I believe it was a school in, in Prague. They were able to look at and read inside that tablet. What that tablet said was essentially, cursed is the one who, and then he mentions the name of God, the divine name. What you're looking at there is a tablet that mentions specific cursing to those who do not obey God. That folded lead, what they're calling the cursed tablet, was dated now although it has not been peer reviewed as far as the information that's out there verified by multiple sources, but they're dating this to, I believe, the 12th or 13th century, which would be not exactly the time of Joshua, but very close. So what we have in our hand is someone having dug up a folded lead curse tablet from the mountain on top of which Moses said, when you get into the land, put a blessing on Mount Gerizim and a curse on Mount Ebal. Once again, reaffirming something the Bible has taught us. So when they get into the land, they're supposed to have this physical representation, this visual representation, blessing on this mountain, cursing on this mountain. Verse 31, for you will cross over the Jordan and go in to possess the land which your Lord your God has given you, and you will possess it and dwell in it. And you should be careful to observe all the statutes and judgments which I set before you today. Now, if you would, turn over to chapter 30 of the same book. Turn over to chapter 30 of the, of the book of Deuteronomy. Now, I want to mention again, you see an advertisement for a new car or for a house refinance loan or for some grand prize somebody is offering. There's fine print. There's itty-bitty print. I want you to notice what God says here in this very first verse we're going to read. Deuteronomy chapter 30 and verse 11. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. You know what God just said? There is no fine print here. You know what you need to know. Now, we've talked about quite a bit, right? Deuteronomy 29, 20, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. So the things God has given us is all we need to be able to live our lives in a way that's pleasing to him. And he just says, 11 verses later, this commandment's not too mysterious. This commandment's not too hard to understand. I'm not hiding things from you in this commandment. You know all that you need to know. He said, it is not far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. For if the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, that you may do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. And that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. The Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if you turn your hearts away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. And you shall not prolong your days in the land which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Look at what he says. Therefore, choose, that implies we have the ability to, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, and that you may cling to him, for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give them. God promised them preservation. That's our first point. God promised them preservation. God promised them blessing. 
God promised them homes. God promised them produce. God promised them protection if they were willing to abide by the conditions. That brings us to point number two. And any of us who have picked up our Bible for any point in period of time, we know that preservation did not happen for that physical nation because there was punishment, which is point number two, because of their unfaithfulness. We have to summarize. We have to do kind of a, a fly-by bird's eye view of Israel's unfaithfulness. Because if we were to sit down tonight and to discuss every scripture that talked about Israel's unfaithfulness, we would be here longer than if we finished the temptation in the alphabet. Because the Old Testament is full. That is not hyperbole. It is full of Israel disappointing God. It is full of Israel leaving God, forgetting about God, turning away from God. Perhaps, regardless of what time period they lived in, one verse that accurately typified the mentality of God's people is the very last verse in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Whether they had judges, whether they had kings, whether they were led by Moses, Aaron, or Joshua, it really didn't matter. For most generations, that was the faith. That was the case. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. God said, come in here. I will bless you. I will love you. I will provide for you if you'll only do what I ask. So many times you seem to see them saying, I love what God offers, but I really want to do what I want. No, our world's not really different. Cultures change, language change. A lot of things change over the years, but people don't. If we were to summarize in four quick points, some of the, the high points of Israel's unfaithfulness before God that resulted in their punishment, it would be that very first generation that came out of Egypt that fell in the wilderness in Numbers chapter 14. It would be that very first generation after Joshua and the elders that served with him. When you read in Judges chapter 2 and verse 10, there arose a generation that knew not God. It would be the punishment of God allowing the northern kingdom to go into Assyrian captivity in 2 Kings chapter 17. And it would finally be the southern kingdom going into Babylonian captivity that we read of in Jeremiah chapter 52 when Jerusalem is destroyed. Those are perhaps four of the highest points of Israel's punishment because of their unfaithfulness. But you know, God's punishment for Israel was not confined to the Old Testament. God's disappointment in the nation of Israel was not confined to the Old Testament. In fact, in the book of John, John writes to us in chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, and he talks about the one whom God would send. He talked about the Son of God, the light and life of men, as he mentioned earlier in that chapter. And he says that he would come to his own, and his own wouldn't receive him. His own countrymen would reject him. In fact, there was a time in Jesus' life where his own family rejected him and didn't even believe who he was. How could you live with him and not know who he is? How could you witness the life of Jesus and not know who he is, but even his own family didn't have faith in him? Perhaps so much so was the lack of faith in Jesus that as he's there on the cross, he sees his mother, and instead of asking his own brothers to take care of his mom, he asks John to take care of her. God's disappointment with Israel was not confined to the Old Testament. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Luke. Go with me to chapter 13. I want you to look at the words of Jesus in Luke chapter 13. Now, earlier on in the chapter, very beginning, Jesus addresses some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus essentially says, these weren't worse sinners than other Galileans. Then he talks about 18 on whom the Tower of Siloam fell and died. He said they weren't worse sinners than others who dwelt in Jerusalem. 
He says everyone is essentially equal in sinning, and everyone will perish if they don't repent. Then in verse 6, it says he spoke a parable. Let's read it. He also spoke this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. Then he said to the keeper of his vineyard, Look, for three years I have come seeking, seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why does it use up the ground? But he answered and said to him, Sir, let it alone this year also until I dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit, well. But if not, after that, you can cut it down. What's Jesus talking about? Well, we know that Jesus' parable about the man who finds sheep wasn't about real sheep. Jesus' parable about the woman who lost the coin wasn't really about the coin. Jesus' parable about the wise and foolish virgins weren't really about virgins. Jesus' parable about the pearl of great price wasn't a real pearl. So we can know when you look at Luke chapter 13, Jesus is not talking about a real fig tree. So what is he talking about? Well, he mentions the fig tree that should have fruit but does not have fruit. Something that is entrenched. Something that has been planted. Something that has been there a while. And as it has been viewed year after year after year, there's no fruit that comes from it. What he's talking about is the Jewish nation. And that for the three years of his earthly ministry, there is not adequate fruit that is being produced. They don't believe in him. They don't trust him. They won't follow him. And it's about to die. God's disappointment in the nation of Israel is not confined to the Old Testament. He says, leave it alone this year also. I'm going to work a little bit harder at it. I'm going to work a little bit longer at it. And then if it still doesn't produce, then go ahead and remove it. You know what happened? Jesus completed his three-and-a-half-ish year earthly ministry. The Jews still did not produce faith in the Lord, obedience to the Lord. Less than 40 years after the Lord was crucified, as we read in the last few verses of the same chapter, Luke chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, God's final physical blow to the nation of Israel was dwelt with the destruction of their city. They didn't believe in God. They didn't believe in the one he sent. They didn't believe in Jesus as God. The fig tree didn't produce. God removed the blessings. There was great promise, and great potential in following God if they would meet the conditions. But generation after generation, they did not meet those conditions. Our last point tonight is perseverance. And we shift wheels just a, a little bit, change gears. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. And go to chapter number two. Because as we talk about Israel in the Bible, we need to ask ourselves and make ourselves clear if we're teaching someone else which Israel we're talking about. Are we talking about physical Israel? Are we talking about the Israelites that came from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Are we talking about the Israelites of whom David was a part, of whom Solomon was a part, of whom Paul was a part? Or are we talking about spiritual Israel? What we find out when we turn over from our Bibles from the Old Testament to the New is Israel is still promised blessings by God, but the makeup of what comprises Israel changes. It shifts from that which is physical to that which is spiritual. Romans chapter 2, verse 28, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is his circumcision, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to look at two more verses about this. Galatians chapter 3. And in verse 26, Paul writes, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. They were not Israel physically, but they were Israel. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. 
There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then guess what? You are Abraham's seed. Then you are Israel. And heirs according to the promise. Let's go back now to the book of Romans. And look at chapter 9. Paul writes to the Roman church and he says in chapter 9 and verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Pay very close attention. For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. What the Bible is teaching us here is that Israel is no longer a physical nation of those who can identify based on their blood heritage. Israel is a spiritual nation in the eyes of God now that is comprised as such by the blood heritage of the Lord. It says, verse 7, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac, your seed should be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Those who are blessed by the lineage of Abraham, which was the Christ, who shed his blood to redeem man from their sins, purchased the church. And it is with that blood that we have a lineage of spiritual Israel. Because of that, you and I should consider ourselves blessed. I don't know everything about my lineage. I don't know everything about my history. I know my wife and my granddad did a lot of looking into our history. I know we've got some Irish in our family somewhere on my mother's side. I know we've got a lot of heavy Scottish influence on my dad's side. I know also on my dad's side, we have some, some Creek Indian heritage. I don't know of any Jewish heritage, though. I don't know that we have even the slightest amount of Jewish blood in our family's history. But you see, I don't have to have Jewish blood in my family's history. I don't have to have my identity in Jewish blood. I just have to have my identity in the Lord's blood. That makes us children of God of spiritual Israel. You see, the promises that God offers to the world in the New Testament through the blood heritage and lineage of his son that has washed them and cleansed them, that allows us to identify as spiritual Israel. These exceed the promises of the Old Testament. No longer are we looking for an earthly kingdom. No longer are we looking for a physical nation. No longer are we hoping for produce from the land. But our citizenship, Philippians chapter 3 and verse 20, is in heaven. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. Turn to chapter 11. I don't know if you have attempted to make any personal connection throughout this lesson. I hope that you have. I don't know if you have attempted to draw any personal conclusions from this lesson. Now, what I have done over the past 35, 40 or so minutes is spoken of the blessings that God offered to ancient physical Israel. Spoken of how God had pleaded with them and promised to protect them. And that they rejected God's promises. They rejected God's blessings and were then summarily punished. Then I've told us how blessed we are to be a part of spiritual Israel. You and I should be proud of that opportunity. Proud that God has considered us worthy to be able to be invited into this kingdom, into this family, into this lineage. But I've also constructed the lesson for that reason, in that way, on purpose. Because we are not done. All of the lesson has built up to our main text. A lot of times we start with our main text. Not tonight. Tonight we finish with it. Our main text is in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches were broken off, that is physical Israel, and you, being a wild olive tree, those who are not physical Israel, were grafted in among them, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, 
Remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. Pay attention to the next couple of verses. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. Those who fell severity, but towards you goodness. Notice that verse does not stop after goodness. Those who fell severity, but on you goodness. If you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. Let me make the point of the lesson by saying this. You and I are blessed to be able to be invited into spiritual Israel. We have the best, and I don't even like using that word, but I don't know what else to use. The best prize available to us, and that is the opportunity to enter into heaven. Well, we don't have to worry about how our bodies fail us about how other people let us down, about how we're disgusted with the sin that lives around us. We are invited into a place where there is no sun, is no moon, is no need for the sun and the moon, because the glory of God illumines it. And the lamp is the light of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 21 tells us. You and I are afforded the entrance into eternal peace and joy in heaven for years that we can't even begin to fathom. That's been given to us as an alternative to what we deserve, which is separation from God and, and, and destruction, condemnation. You and I have been given that opportunity by God, not because of anything good we've done, but because of God's grace, because of God's mercy, because of the obedience of his son, because of the majesty of the plan, because of the effectiveness of the message, and because of the power of the spirit. We are offered that great blessing to be a part of spiritual Israel. But do not, I'm going to steal Brother Petaway's phrase, do not get it twisted. What God did to unfaithful physical Israel, God will do to unfaithful spiritual Israel. You and I are blessed to be part of this family, but entrance into this family does not guarantee us heaven. What guarantees us heaven is God's grace, God's mercy, the Lamb's blood. And our perseverance. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. But we continue. Think about the words of the Apostle Paul. In Philippians chapter 3. I have not yet attained. I have not yet apprehended. I have not yet completed it. I have not yet arrived there. But there's one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I pressed for the prize of the call of God, the high calling of God in Jesus. What God did to unfaithful physical Israel, God will also do to us, spiritual Israel, if we are unfaithful. Now, God was long-suffering. God waited, and he waited, and he waited, and he waited. But ultimately, those blessings, that protection, those things were removed because they removed God from their minds. They removed God from their hearts. You and I are guaranteed a home in the presence of God. But we need to keep God front and center to make that happen. We need to keep our eyes trained in the Lord to make that happen. We need to keep our mind versed in the Bible to make that happen. If we continue, we have a salvation that is provided for us. We are kept by the power of God for salvation, that final salvation through God and faith, Peter writes. Let's continue. Through dark days, through bright days, through good times, through bad times, whatever the world and the devil and anything else may throw at us. Let's make a personal decision. I'm going to follow God no matter what else comes. I'm going to be faithful to God no matter what else comes. Because God's grace and your purposeful decision to persevere 
Those things guarantee us an entrance. If these things are in you and abound, they make you so that you should neither be unfruitful nor barren in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior. If we do these things, the Bible tells us, Peter writes for us in 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning there in verse 8 and 9, verse 10 says, you will never fall, for so an entrance will be provided for you into the everlasting kingdom. God offers us promises just as he did ancient Israel, only they're better promises. Won't we pay better attention than ancient Israel did? Won't we pay better attention than physical Israel did? What God did to unfaithful physical Israel, he will do to unfaithful spiritual Israel. But the opposite of that is true too. What God promised for physical Israel, God also promises and guarantees spiritual Israel. Only they're better, more enduring promises. There is no fine print. There is no catch. God has made it very clear for us what he wants from us, what he expects from us, and the conditions that are necessary. God is able to do one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think. God will provide us entrance into heaven. Are we willing to meet the conditions? Today and until the Lord comes or we die, are we willing to meet, to meet the conditions to see the glory of God? You've seen the evidence of what happens to those who were not willing. Are we willing? As a congregation, as a church globally, as families, more importantly tonight, as individuals, are you willing to meet the conditions? to see the glory of God and receive his promises. God offers us salvation through the blood of his son. That's the blood heritage and lineage that we want through obedience to the gospel, hearing the word and believing it, repenting of our past sins, confessing Jesus as the Christ and son of God and savior and being baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. At that point, being placed into his body and granted an entrance into heaven so long as we persevere. If you've not done that tonight, don't put it off and wait until it's too late. God's got great and glorious promises and blessings that are waiting for you, but you've got to meet the conditions. For those who have already met those conditions or already living that life as a Christian, realize that our life as a Christian does not end at baptism, but begins at baptism. It ends when the Lord comes. It ends when we leave this earth. Let's meet the conditions daily. Taking up our cross, as Jesus said, daily and following him, knowing that those promises are out there. That glory is waiting. The indescribable beauty of heaven exists and is waiting for us if we'll only meet the conditions. If you have a need tonight, whatever that need may be, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.
For the Lord's Supper, we'll sing hymn number 365, verses 1 through 4. 365, verses 1. You have it? Let us sing. Let us If you're here tonight and have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper earlier today, uh, please let us know by holding your hand. Hold up your hand. Do we have one? Okay, we have one. And you over here. Shall we bow? Our Father, which art in heaven, we're so thankful for the blessings that you've given us. And now we pray that uh, as those who partake of it will partake of this bread, which represents the body of Christ on Calvary. May we partake of it in a way that be pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shall we continue our thanks for the fruit of the vine? Heavenly Father, we're again thankful that we have the opportunity to, to uh, celebrate our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood of Christ on Calvary, may we do so in a, in a way that be well-pleasing in thy sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
not a part of the communion, but uh, is our ability to give back to the congregation, to this church, for the work of the church, uh, a contribution. If you'd like to give, there's a box in the, in the foyer as you leave. Tommy, for our closing prayer, will be hymn number 616. If you would, please stand. You have it. Let's stand. I'm satisfied with just a copy of and a little, but in that city, where the rest will shine, I want to do that simple life. Just over the hill, and that right next will never grow. And someday I'll be never more wonder. But walk the streets as our human principle. The walk in No permanent And <laughs> Just over there in the top. Is that right? And something that's Shall we bow? Hey, Father, we thank you for another first day of the week to come together to study and to worship and to fellowship. We ask, Father, that everything we did this first day of the week and every first day of the week will be in accordance with your word and that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight and that it was always done in decency and in order. We ask you forgive us of our sins be with those who are suffering, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, or bereavement. We ask that you be with us all, those who are suffering in those areas. As we leave each other's presence as the body, the church of Christ, we ask, Father, that you would continue to help us grow in love for one another. For how can we love God if we don't love each other? Father, be with us, protect us from the devil, knowing that he's to and fro seeking on whom he made a vow. And we pray, pray this and many other blessings in your son Jesus' name. Amen.